So we have come to the point in our program where we have an open dialogue, a couple of uh, sages in our, in our, uh, in our uh, community of nutritionists and scientists and journalists, uh, and uh, they will offer a few comments. Um, uh, we have Scott Shane from the New York Times uh, and former Baltimore Sun and a micronutrient devotee. <laughs> There aren't many in journalism that are there. Uh, while he's not doing you know, stories on terrorism. Uh, uh, with us, who's going to be our moderator, we have uh, Dr. Manfred Eggersdorfer. Uh, we have Dr. Um, uh, Ellen Piwaz. And I think that's all, right? Did I miss somebody? For the panelists? No, they did. Great. You know, my neurons are still connected. Um, so what we would like to do is if you would please come on up, and we have chairs here for each of you. Uh, and Scott, we will let you run the show. Uh, and uh, we, we're asking for some reflections, and then we will open this dialogue up to everybody, and no questions are, are to be barred. You can ask anything you want to anybody you want. Um, and uh, we'll take it from here. There's an old definition of a journalist as someone who explains to others things he does not understand himself. And never did it apply uh, more than, than maybe me being here today. Um, I do, since 9-11, like a lot of journalists, uh, as, as Keith mentioned, I focused mainly on terrorism, counterterrorism. So for several years, I focused on interrogation and torture, and then targeted killing, and then lately, um, surveillance. Hello, NSA. Uh, and uh, so it's nice to be with a bunch of people who focus on keeping people alive instead of how to kill them. Um, but long ago, 13 years ago, um, Parul Christian, as she mentioned, allowed me and a, and a wonderful photographer from the Baltimore Sun named Chiaki Kawajiri uh, follow her around, trail after her for about a month in Sharlahi in, in Nepal during one of these uh, big maternal nutrition studies. And um, it, you know, it occurred to me, Parul, that uh, th those kids are now teenagers. So <clears throat> if, if things really go well, if you guys all work hard, uh, eventually those teenagers, teenagers like them, uh, will be able to advance to the point where they're on that um, Coke, pizza, and beer uh, diet that teenagers in this country have achieved. Uh, so it's, it's something to shoot for. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So two, but two slightly more serious um, things that I recall when I think back on, on uh, trailing around uh, Nepal and, and uh, uh, watching this research done. One is, as a journalist, you sort of in, in your awkward, unscientific way try to move towards the facts, move towards the truth, try to figure out what is, what is real. And I was, I was left with a very powerful impression of how hard people in this field work uh, using clinical trials to eliminate, you know, sort of uh, myths and prejudices and wishful thinking and move towards the, the truth. And um, in, in a project like, like that one, where there were uh, these uh, Nepalese guys on motorbikes uh, with electronic scales strapped to the back who were rushing off to get to um, these mud huts where women had just given birth so they could weigh the, the newborn. I mean, you know, it, it is amazing the lengths that, uh, that, that you all go to to kind of get a little bit closer to what really happens. And there's a kind of heroism in the willingness to do all that work and then accept a, a negative finding, to essentially have spent a huge amount of money, time, and life to disprove your hypothesis. The second thing was the historical perspective that, that watching that study gave me. Um, I became obsessed for a while with trying to figure out when the, the health indicators, sort of big, big health indicators like infant mortality, child mortality in Baltimore were the same 
uh, as they were in, in 2000 when we were looking at, uh, at, at those indicators in Nepal. And I came up with, you know, sort of a ballpark, depending on what indicator you're looking at, of, of around 1915. And, you know, that actually ended up being um, something that made me um, much more optimistic, maybe, about, about human progress than I had been. Um, if, you know, we spent a lot of time in uh, villages with a lot of tragedy, talking to women who'd lost their babies, talking to uh, parents who were terrified that their children were malnourished and uh, they had no way to feed them. And it could be very depressing, but it, it's amazing in the tens of thousands of years of human history to think of what kind of progress has been made, you know, in a, in a century uh, in a place like Baltimore. And then it sort of sent me back and I looked at the same um, indicators for Nepal in 1960. I remember and, and was sort of stunned to see that as bad as it was in 2000, it, it had been a whole lot worse in 1960. And uh, so that really made me think that, um, that maybe there is hope. Uh, and for that, I was grateful for uh, these folks letting me um, come in with my uh, journalistic ignorance and, uh, and try to learn a little bit. Thanks. Actually, it's like a prop, and I feel a little nervous actually sitting here. And um, I don't know why. I think the last time I was in this room, I was studying epidemiology, and that was a long time ago. Um, first of all, thanks, uh, Keith, for in inviting me. Uh, it's been a really interesting day. I've really learned a lot. Um, just fascinating. I think you called it a Whitman sampler. Um, normally, I'm a super optimistic person. I'm very upbeat, and I'm always a glass half full person. I have to confess, I feel a little bit. Uh, down, downbeat in a way, and I'll tell you a little bit why that is, and I don't know if it's the dark room or, or what. Um, I did learn it's not really a good thing to be the dean, or you don't want to be the dean, you get to be the butt of all the jokes. Um, but beside that, and a more serious note, um, I think it was a really interesting day, and the reason I'm feeling downbeat, because I like to find solutions, I like clarity to come out, and, uh, and a lot of what I heard today was um, things I already knew, because I, I'm a self, uh, self-proclaimed nutrition champion, uh, and I study nutrition here. Um, uh, but nutrition is, um, you know, it was very, very clear from all of the presentations, but the wonderful presentation uh, that you gave Dr. Ames, uh, making the case that nutrition is really foundational to so many things and to human health and life. And it's complex. And that very first slide that you showed just really hit home. The whole entire day, I had that imprinted on my mind as I was listening to all those presentations, because it really is complex. And when there's complexity, it's sometimes hard to make sense out of things and to figure out um, the right way forward. And the other thing that um, really struck me is, uh, Al, you're, you're, we got it right, we got it wrong, we got it right. <laughs> and to me, that's the pendulum that's been swinging around in the nutrition world for a very long time. And it's 100 years, and I started to think, oh my god, how do we make sure we don't get it wrong again? And then I started to think, it's been 100 years, there's been, you actually, in your presentation, made the case we've learned so much, we've actually forgotten what we've learned. And <laughs> it is complex, we've learned a lot, we've forgotten things, we've gotten it right, we've gotten it wrong, we've gotten it right again. And I was thinking about, well, what does that mean for me? Because I know you invited me here, not because I'm an esteemed this, but because I actually work for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and I feel like I have the, the honor and the privilege of, of making decisions about how what I think are far too scarce resources are, are being dedicated to the study of nutrition. And it's a really daunting challenge, and I like to come to things, meetings like this and to talk to people and to hear different perspectives and to really make my mind be challenged because I feel an obligation to make the right decisions about how we use scarce resources. And the thing that struck me is why, given the complexity, given the foundation, the importance of the field that we're in, why is it that, at least on the side of undernutrition, we have you know, relatively few resources? And I think that has been impairing our ability to really launch ahead in terms of understanding some of the things that I think might be essential to, um, to getting, making sure we don't get off track again. And so the one thing that really struck me in um, listening to the talks is um, 
you know, we, we look back, we, we had a lot of interesting history, and again, it's, you know, the 100 years is something really important. Uh, we saw a lot of data from the 1990s and 80s and things like that. I was struck by when we were talking about dietary patterns uh, across the board, for the most part, we were still using data that were quite old. And I think about how much the world has changed and the many populations where we work in particular and here in Baltimore as well. I mean, diets have really changed. The world has really changed. And I feel that we in the community have this huge, what I'm going to just call for lack of better term, a measurement problem. <laughs> And at the Gates Foundation, when we present our nutrition strategy, we present a lot of those beautiful maps that Klaus showed and Bob showed and things like that. And our leadership goes, well, those are poverty maps. <laughs> They're not necessarily maps that tell you where the problems are, who's most affected, and how you really reach the people who need them. And so I'm thinking about, and this is a little bit of a challenge in terms of thinking for the next 100 years, you know, where do we want to be? What is the research agenda? How do we solve? some of the most pressing problems that we have. How do we make sure that we're measuring the right things? We know a lot, enough about the problem as well as the solutions. How we take your dream world, which I love, <laughs> and Keith's reality of those stacks and stacks of papers and those big machines, and really think very strategically about how we bring all those things together. So my call here, my reflection here, is a, just a desire, especially among the research world, to think very strategically. What is the next 100 years supposed to look like uh, for the world of uh, vitamins and minerals, and I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my reflections of the day. Keith uh, and all the speakers, uh, it was a great day to, on one hand side, look back what has been achieved in 100 years of vitamin A, or in general 100 years of, vitamin, uh, of vitamins, and uh, reflecting on this, uh, yes, life expectancy doubled in this uh, period. I think uh, the nutrients contributed uh, to this. I think uh, we have, uh, we are able to fight deficiencies. We have fortification programs uh, in place in many, many countries. Uh, however, I think it is not only looking back, let's look forward, and I think you expressed uh, rightly, the presentations should give an outlook, where do we go, where do we uh, want to uh, go? And uh, I think research groups all over the world really contribute to the key topics and provide insights uh, for health and wellness. Nevertheless, uh, 100 years, uh, let's digest some of the figures. Uh, still, uh, this is not vitamins, however minerals, 2 billion people are deficient in, in uh, iron, 1 billion deficient in zinc, uh, 500 million uh, people deficient in, uh, no, 750 million deficient in iodine. Vitamins, vitamin A, 200 million uh, children uh, deficient uh, in vitamin A. <coughs> vitamin D, uh, if you take the figures from IOF, 500 million people are deficient in vitamin D. Uh, if you take 50 uh, nanomoles as cutoff point, it's 2.6 billion people who are below this uh, recommended value. value. If you take 75 nanomole, it's 6.2 billion people which are below the optimal value. And uh, looking uh, on the uh, global burden of disease, yes, we learned that alone in the last 20 years, we have globally five more years to live. However, the major part uh, of this additional lives are unhealthy life. So it's very much what Dr. Bruce Ames said, we have to care that we, in the, in the later life, let me say, stay healthy, continue to stay healthy. So this brings me uh, to uh, uh, the topic, I think nutrition is the most important topic of this next century, of this century. And this brings me back what you also said, because I think I have two topics to mention. Uh, and the topic one is, I think we have to engage that funding organizations take nutrition as a key priority, as the number one priority. And the number two message I would like to give is that we have to engage and bring out and communicate the message about the role of nutrients for health and wellness communicate and advocate for this and make this happen. This is my, the learning 
the reflections of the day to day. Well, thanks. My orders from Keith are basically that it's going to be a free for all from here on. And, um, and anybody out there is allowed to ask anybody anything. Um, no censorship. Uh, but just to get the ball rolling, uh, you know, this has been touched on by several speakers, but let me just throw a question out there for anyone to, to address. The, you know, most of the presentations were focused on a, um, on a malnourished third world population. Some were touching on, you know, the kind of beer and pizza crowd in this country. Um, and sometimes it seems like looking out the world at the world from from a um, an amateur perspective that countries are passing from the kind of um, malnourished population to the to the kind of obese population without anything in between. But I wonder if anyone could address the relevance of of uh, you know you know how that how that transition occurs. Are there any countries that um, that are sort of midway between? Those uh, worlds, and is there is there any country that's sort of going in a, in a in a totally healthy direction in, ter in terms of nutrition and, and micronutrients? Anybody want to take that one? <laughs> Bob, uh, let's see. Well, I, I can make a couple comments. I'm not sure I could identify any country in particular that is is uh, in, entirely in a healthy direction, but but in the in the series, we actually looked at the trends in overweight and obesity now instead of just looking at undernutrition. And certainly there are increases in all regions of the world. In, in Latin America, in the, the Americas, about 60% of reproductive age women are overweight or obese. So we're already seeing very steep trends. And those trends are being replicated in, in Africa, certainly, and a little more slowly, but in Asia also. Um, but we also have um, the inequities or disparities. So we're we're seeing that um, that there is uh, stunting and there is overweight and there is micronutrient deficiencies in the same population. So people talk about the double burden of disease, and and in fact the early origin, as Perul talked about, the early origins of that. So part of that story is in common between the undernutrition occurring and the stunting happening in the, in the fetal period and the first two years and the subsequent risk that those same individuals will have obesity and chronic disease in adults. So it's all part of the, the same picture, but as, as economic development happens, there is exposure to less healthy diets and, and less exercise and all that. So I, I think it's a global phenomenon. I think we're, we're, you know, we're seeing those trends all over the world, and I, I don't have a solution, but I, I think it does in part go back to the, the early uh, thousand days, uh, but that's not the only problem. There's certainly additional issues around school age uh, and, uh, you know, increasing obesity and, you know, it's a big problem. I don't have an answer. Thank you. Um, so who has a question for anybody? Uh, rather than a question, well, it's sort of a question. Uh, to pick up on what Bob was saying, I'm sort of thinking about it for a moment, and this may be entirely off base, I think we have the under nutrition, the hidden hunger, micronutrient deficiencies in populations, uh, which basically is un unserved by the private sector, because there's no money to be made there. Our overnutrition, which is where we sort of flip right in, as soon as people have a little bit of money, then the private sector gets very interested. And our overnutrition is all, be in my way of thinking, is all because the private sector has gotten involved and decided that they're going to say to McDonald's and Cokes and, and everything else. And there is, you know, that's the reason there's no, nothing in between. You've got people who have too little, and it's the Bob's thing, or, or yours. The, you're looking at poverty, you're looking at undernutrition, you're looking at escaping from poverty, you're going to look at overnutrition. Um, and I don't know if Bob or others have any thoughts about that. Just to add a little nuance to that, um, one of the things that really, I don't know if anybody in the room collects dietary data among under twos in the developing world. Anyone? Um, so we have a number of grants, <laughs> we have a number of grants uh, in countries in Africa and Asia, in rural areas and semi-urban areas, and a really startling observation that we've been making uh, 
relatively recent. I don't know when it started, but an extraordinary percentage of children, infants, are consuming uh, basically what I would call junk food, soda. I mean, nine, you know, so I, I can't, I, if I knew I was going to talk about this, I'd have the numbers to rattle off my head. I'm not as good as you. <laughs> but, you know, more than half of nine-month-olds were consuming soda in a 24-hour re recall in a semi-urban area in Malawi. Um, chips, candy, chocolate. I mean, the, the differentiate, I, I agree to some extent in terms of the high level, you have that kind of differentiation, but you are very much seeing this merging of, um, and infiltration of you know processed and ultra processed unhealthy foods in this young age group. It's really it's quite shocking actually, and I hate to think you know I think clearly the triple burden is what we're going to be living with um, for a long time. I think from my side, uh, I think uh, addressing this topic, yes, uh, for me uh, learning these uh, figures means on one hand side bringing the nutrients up and the energy down. So this is the way forward and the challenge and opportunity we are uh, we have we have ahead of us hi I recently um, heard a lecture by John Groupman who's a, f a professor at environmental health that described an interesting transition and I've been interested in uh, liver cancer in particular and he was talking about populations in China which had been on a maize corn diet and now with some economic development, they have a rice diet and the, they're less exposed to aflatoxin and the rates of liver cancer are declining in China where it was, uh, still is a major problem. But there are changes in populations with economic and I think China is probably a country where there, there has been some changes in diet, in the diet of, of large populations. And I, I think it would be a pretty interesting. The other question I wanted to ask is, all of the data here have talked about uh, more or less cross-sectional deficiencies. I wonder what, uh, ex to what extent these are seasonal. Because certainly, um, I, I you know I eat corn all summer, but I, the, the, you know, the, uh, the diets change probably everywhere over the years, maybe less so in a real po impoverished population, but I wonder to what extent the seasonal differences have been examined. Who wants to take that one? I can briefly respond to it. <laughs> so in the data that we uh, uh, collected in Nepal, we look, looked at seasonality for sure. and. Um, even exposure to sun is a very seasonal phenomenon such that you see the vitamin D levels changing um, uh, by season and whether people were outside in the field working versus on a cloudy day staying inside. Um, but lots of foods are very seasonal and there's clearly a hungry period and a non-hungry period and um, you see that in the markets. You see when you go out that there's nothing but potatoes, onions, and gourds in one season versus the green leafy vegetables and the tomatoes and, and other, other um, um, good stuff uh, in, in some. Is reflected in these data? <laughs> yes, and so I, um, in the Gambian uh, studies, they have shown that seasonality of birth has a, an impact on long-term survival. So babies born in the hungry season had an increased risk of mortality as young adults, so they're dying of infectious causes, not as, not with age-related causes, but that there are differences just by the birth of season. Thank you very much. Yes, I, um, I was very much interested in your talk, Keith. Um, and I'm wondering, I'm, com I'm, um, uh, I lean towards thinking of cancer as a disease of nutrition as well, particularly since I think that the cancer cell has a different requirement for nutrients. And I'm wondering, uh, your studies that you've done on the blood, because obviously you can't take biopsies of people and things like that, so it's convenient to do it in, in blood. So you're really studying a blood proteome. 
Um, would that approach, and I think the answer is yes, probably, but I'm asking you, would that approach apply to biopsies of cancer tissue, specifically to study the relationship between nutrients, particularly essential nutrients, and proteomes in cancer cells, as compared to, of course, you need the comparison, and that comparison has to be made with the tissue of origin of that cancer. Now, that would provide an enormous amount of information, I think. Maybe I'm very optimistic. But I think we still don't know in a cancer cell, for instance, whether or not RBP that you mentioned has a receptor that would allow for that retinol to be internalized and to be metabolized to retinoic acid, which would then allow the interaction with the retinoic acid receptors, which would then turn on a lot of genes and so on and so forth. So, the, your approach applied to solid tissue may be also quite interesting, I think. Can you comment on that? Yeah, I, I can't begin to answer that question, uh, but we have to put it in context. This is Dr. Luigi DeLuca, who ran an NIH laboratory that made numerous discoveries on retinoids and cancer uh, through the 70s, 80s, and 90s. So I am the least qualified person to address a question to uh, address that question but I like what you said and so I think we should take it as a comment <laughs> thank you um, I want to comment on on this issue of uh, undernutrition and poverty, because I think it's, it's critical. And when you mentioned that, when you show a map of any deficiency, they tell you uh, that's a map of poverty. There is a good reason for that. But I think more than uh, the issue of poverty, which is obvious to, to all of us that somebody who cannot afford food will have a nutritional problem, is the issue of disparity. Because over the past uh, 30 and 40 years, we all talk about progress and progress driving the nutrition transition. But the reality is that the progress has reduced the disparity between nations, but has increased the disparity within nations. And the big nations that are increasing more, like Brazil, South Africa, India, are increasing their disparities. There are a lot of people left behind. But these people left behind are not left behind in utter poverty as 50 years ago. They get something more. They get enough to eat more calories, to eat low quality, nutrient uh, uh, deficient foods, but to gain weight. And uh, they are left without a care system, prevention, resources, education. And therefore, you see undernourished kids becoming obese. And we look at the biological phenomenon, and there is one, and, and you can model this phenomenon of early undernutrition, later excess adiposity in uh, any uh, kind of animal models. But uh, we should not forget that this is a human-made phenomenon. It's not a biology as destiny. This has to do with the way that countries that are progressing are progressing. They chose to progress in a certain way, to open to the global market, to allow multinational corporations to dictate the food chain inside the countries. And this is having an impact that is which much more powerful than most governments can do to control. And this is the fight that you see in countries that are trying to do something, Mexico, Chile, Brazil, the, the, what they're trying to do is confront multinational corporations. They're trying to stop the wave of junk food in their countries in different ways. Mexico just approved a tax to junk food and soft drinks. Um, we are all very interested in seeing uh, this experiment in a 100 million people country. But I think the, what we need to keep in mind is that beyond the biology, there is an actual way to organize societies that people uh, have to decide and fight in each one of these countries. And uh, for this, the model of simply doing good and providing technical assistance is not enough anymore. just a complexity that I think um, was reflected in some of the discussions today, but also that uh, is a complexity that I've dealt with or we have dealt with as a, as a nutrition community. Uh, it's related to um, 
understanding mechanisms of the effects of micronutrients vis-a-vis uh, -vis finding their effects on cer certain outcomes of interest. Sometimes we see an impact on mortality without understanding the mechanisms underlying that impact. And sometimes we see these beautiful studies being done looking at mechanisms which reveal the potential for a, a huge impact and you don't see that in the epidemiologic studies. And so I think that complexity, um, I don't know how it can go away and how, how do we continue to work together. So I, I think about bottom feeders and top feeders and you know, trying to understand the mechanisms. They, they, they have to come together at some point and somewhere um, to, to make progress. I, I think that, that's just my <laughs> comment. I don't know if there's anyone who wants me to talk about that. Uh, I'll, I'll try one quick response. Um, it, it partly responding to um, Ellen's um, sense of, of uh, how this day unrolled, un unraveled, or unrolled, whatever way you want to call it. <laughs> uh, uh, I think, uh, and, and it relates to uh, Professor Ames' uh, triage theory as well. That is, um, this day was not really meant to tie things together. This was meant to just open it up and, and sort of look at where we are across a whole wide range of uh, micronutrient-related quality of diet, uh, regional uh, and global issues, and, uh, from cell to society, and, and to, in, in a way, embrace that complexity uh, without necessarily tying it to a policy issue, though uh, Dr. Black provided that, that sort of you know, foundational uh, foundation on which we can stand. You know, we do have interventions that will achieve certain levels of impact for major outcomes. We, we know that. But we know that there's a lot more and a lot that we don't understand. And I don't think we can get away from that complexity. I think at public health, our job is to wrap that, that, that complexity up and eventually find a signal that can be understood and acted upon by wider circles. So um, zinc is a complex nutrient, thousands of genes, vitamin A, every one of these nutrients are complex. But there are, at times, ways of finding interventions that will have a measurable impact on public health. I think that's where we're, that's where we're after. Perhaps the public health event that we're looking for to change is going to be tougher to measure in the future. Uh, I, and this brings me to the triage theory and trying to connect some dots. Um, the, the two thoughts that came to mind were, in relation to the nutrition transition, vitamin A deficiency is adipogenic in animals. Animals become fatter uh, when they are vitamin A deficient. So is that working in, is that kind of mechanism working in South Asia where we see the thin fat phenotype? Thin people, high body fat. Uh, and, and are they, uh, the fact that they came, they grew up in an undernourished vitamin A deficient setting could that be predisposing them? And therefore, are the epigenetic changes that occur early in life persisting in that kind of a population? Are they, are they fatter? A second point is, like in our follow-up studies, we followed up survivors. So these children were, you know, were, if we believe the triage theory, the nutrients were uh, redirected to help those children survive. And we're seeing some consequences now. We're seeing some consequences to cognition, to lung size, to other things that we start to measure that may be related to these chronic problems that you relate to, uh, Bruce, in your, in your, in your theory. Uh, and that would mean, can we even reverse those uh, in adult life? Or do we, does it mean that we have to really point toward the next generation and work hard at the preconception, conception, uh, 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 pregnancy and early postnatal life. That wasn't very short. Well, it's obviously very complicated. We have culture within the United States. Japanese Americans are living to close to 90. And 
uh, African Americans are living to in their 60s. So that there's some big cultural, and everybody came over poor to America. From all over the world, we got these poor people coming, my ancestors included, and they created wealth. So, uh, so I'm sort of an optimist. Uh, the world, in the last 200 years, the world got wealthy. And partly because you gave people freedom, and people started trading, and you had divisions of labor. Labor, and it, that's increasing, I think. So it's, as long as you give people freedom, they'll create wealth. And so I'm an optimist in the world, and we're learning more and more. And science is a disciplined way of learning. So, right. yeah. Well, we have come to uh, closure uh, in terms of our formal symposium. Uh, I, did, uh, I did want to recognize Omar Dari, who's here from Washington. Omar is the new global advisor on nutrition at USAID. So welcome, Omar. We're glad to see a micronutrient specialist uh, you know, rise to the top in AID nutrition. So um, we're happy to have had you here. Um, also, if you haven't picked up your copy, your free copy uh, of this supplement that was written by and edited by Richard Semba and Klaus Kramer, uh, I think there are still copies out there. And finally, I'd like to invite uh, Dean Clagg uh, to, well, before I do that though, uh, Dean Clagg, I would like to thank our panelists, uh, Scott Shane, Ellen P. Waz, and Manfred Eggersdorfer. Thank you very much. <laughs> and you did a great job holding that around. <laughs> we have a very special moment. Dean, would you like to sure. have the mic? I would like that very much. Thank you. Well, it was a great day. And uh, it was great from the beginning to the end. And many of you noticed I was on my phone because I was tweeting. And the only other person tweeting was Alan Labrique. But uh, <laughs> I, I couldn't tweet fast enough. There were so many uh, pithy comments and, uh, and, and real nuggets. And it, you know, from the beginning, from, from Bruce's talk to the panel discussion to Ben's comment about uh, that it's not, it's not enough to do good and provide technical assistance. That we, and we have to help countries advocate for healthy societies. So, but, uh, but my task, uh, there's one part left, and, and that is that um, uh, it, it's really my pleasure and privilege to present today uh, the highest honor that the Bloomberg School gives, the Dean's Medal, to Royal DSM NV, in recognition of its outstanding global corporate leadership of efforts to mitigate food insecurity, prevent hidden hunger, and promote sustainable development in low-income countries. We're fortunate today to have several uh, representatives from uh, DSM with us, and I'd like to ask them to come up to the stage. Manfred is already here. I'd like to ask Stephen or Stefan Tanda, uh, Klaus Kramer, uh, Michael McBurney, and Norman Salen to please come up and, and join me on the stage. And for those of you who uh, aren't aware of the Dean's Medal, as I said, it's it's the highest honor we give, and it, we give it to uh, individuals who have had. Uh, great impact on the health of the public. Uh, and so this is uh, the first time that we're giving it to a corporation. And so, uh, Stefan, I'll ask you to stand over here, please. And, um, and, it's, and, it's, uh, and I'll just say a little bit about why we've made this decision. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, you can all come up with. Uh, the longstanding collaboration between Hopkins and our school and DSM has taken shape in a number of ways, including through the school's International Advisory Board, on which uh, Feka uh, Sijbezma, who is chairman of the, of the managing board of DSM, serves, the school's Health Advisory Board, on which Manfred Eggersdorfer serves, and through Sight and Life, which Dr. Klaus Kramer directs. Sight and Life is DSM's global humanitarian entity that's dedicated to preventing micronutrient deficiency around the world. With its, a distinguished legacy of outreach to improve public health, DSM and Sight and Life have been of incalculable assistance to our school's mission of protecting health and saving lives millions at a time. Among the contributions of DSM, providing micronutrient uh, supplements, premixes, and technical guidance on complementary food production to our investigators, 
offering internships for master degree students, and providing doctoral scholarships. Ours is a partnership that strives to create knowledge, solve problems, and train tomorrow's leaders in the prevention of micronutrient deficiencies and other forms of malnutrition among underserved populations of the world. So I'd like to ask Stefan to stand here, and I, I'm going to present as a representative of the, of the uh, managing board and in charge of the nutrition cluster at DSM uh, to accept the uh, award on the, uh, in, uh, as a representative of DSM. So in recognition of the global service to public health and humanity, the collaboration and research, its commitment to stronger scholarship in human nutrition, and the trusted and very unusual bond between our institutions, I am pleased to bestow upon you the Dean's Medal, which I hope is in this podium. Thank you. Oh, they moved it. They said it. It's a vitamin A. It's kids. <laughs> so, uh, now this is not a European award, so there will be no kisses. <laughs> and inscribed, inscribed on the back of the medal is Royal DSMNV, a global leader in public private efforts to improve nutrition, nutrition of the world's poor. December 3, 2013. Congratulations. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear Dean, uh, I'm a bit humbled here uh, because uh, th these are all my scientific colleagues. I'm the business guy. Um, so I've been uh, drinking from a fire hose all day. Um, what you do is uh, tremendous and uh, really, really important. Uh, you said, well, uh, you would like to ask DSM about this question on, on micronutrients. Well, frankly, we are a business-to-business -business company, uh, so we don't really make products for consumers. We uh, have to convince our customers um, and the only way they are convinced is by the science that you all create um, and the insights that you create about uh, what works, what doesn't work, what's good for the world, what's not good for the world. Um, and so uh, we are really very much humbled to receive that, but it's really just uh, the little thing we can do to enable you to do your work, uh, to create that insight, uh, to continue humanity's progress along the curve that you uh, showed uh, Professor Ames. So thanks very much for this honor, which I humbly accept for the company. And uh, I wish you a lot and rapid progress to further uh, advance our insights there uh, as, a, as a population. Thank you. There are no more speeches <laughs> other than to invite you to a reception uh, right outside the door in the gallery. There are some posters there to look at. Uh, some, uh, anybody, anyone wanting to see our new $1.25 million <laughs> laboratory on the second floor, but not take it over, but to see it. Uh, uh, Dr. Kerry Schulze is happy to arrange that for you. Uh, but please, uh, you're welcome to a reception. Thank you to our speakers uh, and to all of you who came to participate in today. I, it's, uh, it's been deeply appreciated, uh, the, the level of participation and those of you who came and, and spoke today. Thank you very much. <laughs>